Welcome everybody. I'm Jim Killock, Executive Director of the Open Rights Group. I'd like to thank you for attending this event organised by ourselves in AWO Brussels as part of our work on unlawful ad tech. This is going to be an exciting discussion uh, dealing with the question of automated signals, a key provision that could solve many of the problems that we see today with online advertising. I'd like to thank all of our speakers and of course AWIO for putting on this event together so professionally. Also to Open Society Foundations, Digital Freedom Foundation for the funding and Liberties and Panopticon for their involvement and helping the wider project that this is part of. We're a UK organisation uh, established in 2005. We work on this. We've been working on, the, on uh, work in Belgium as well. Although we're outside of the EU, we think this is very important to keep on this dialogue because of the influence of the UK ad tech industry and ensuring that that kind of alignment can continue. And while I don't want to go through all of our work that we've done in this area because of time considerations and letting Max uh, start this discussion properly, I'll just quickly explain what we are calling for. We're looking for uh, instead of cookie banners for legally binding privacy controls, which allow users to communicate their preferences automatically and persistently um, when they choose. We want to see legally binding standards in the privacy regulation, which will enable technologically su to support uh, the rights of internet users and to see the protections afforded by the GDPR complemented in this kind of way. We wrote to European legislators in May and June to project, reject any proposal that would lower the level of protection afforded by the GDPR uh, in the current e-privacy directive. So that's the kind of policy space that we'll be discussing today. And that's as much as I want to say, because I want to give Max as much time as possible, because he's got a little bit limited time this morning uh, to, to explain some of these issues. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank Please you. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Jim, and welcome everybody to this webinar uh, hosted by Open Rights Group. Um, I'm Catherine, I'm going to be the moderator today, and I'm delighted to be joined for the next hour and a half by a fantastic panel of speakers uh, to talk about how technology and regulation can work together to put people in control of their data. Um, as we're going through, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll cover all of the questions at the end. Um, so I'm joined by uh, a number of fantastic speakers. Uh, I'm joined, first of all, by Max uh, Schrems, who is the honorary chairman at None of Your Business. None of Your Business uses best practices from consumer rights groups, privacy activists, hackers, and legal tech initiatives and merges them into a stable European enforcement platform. Uh, None of Your Business also started the Advanced Data Protection Control, or ADPC, project in collaboration with the Sustainable Computing Lab at the Vienna University of Economic, Economics and Business. I'm also joined by Sophie Infeld, who is an MEP in the European Parliament. She's a D66 member of the European Parliament in the Renew Europe Group, and she has been shadow rapporteur on the e-privacy regulation in the Libe Committee since 2017. I'm also joined by Peter Erbel, who is the Deputy Head of Unit of Cybersecurity and Digital Privacy Policy at the European Commission. He is leading the Commission team, which is negotiating the e-privacy regulation in trilogue meetings with the European Parliament and the Council. I'm also joined by Robin Burjon, who is VP of Data Governance at the New York Times. He focuses on issues of governance, privacy, ethics, and the data economy, and has also been involved in the development of Global Privacy Control, or GPC, which is now supported by the New York Times website. Finally, I'm joined by Anna Buchter, who is the head of unit for policy and consultation at the European Data Protection Supervisor. She coordinates the work of the EDPS on providing advice to the European Commission and other EU institutions and bodies on legislative and policy proposals relevant to data protection. And we are also joined uh, by Alan Toner, who is a data protection consultant who works with none of your business on the Advanced Data Protection Control Project. And he also works with other EU consumer and civil liberties organizations active in the field of advertising and technology and user rights. And he's gonna be taking over the reins from Max to tell us a bit more about ADPC later. So to set off Max, tell us, at, at, at none of your business, you've been a strong advocate for people on privacy. And you've also been very critical of cookie banners. For you, what's failing today in the EU for citizens? 
Um, I think we, for the tissue banners, we mainly have to issue that fundamentally online tracking right now is illegal under the GDPR. So you kind of need to waive your fundamental right to privacy that that's even possible. And that's basically what the cookie banner does. It basically gets people to say, I'm fine, I'm just gonna waive my rights and, and I'll give them, give, give them up. And obviously, um, if you look at industry studies, about 3% of the people in Europe actually want to give up their rights um, to have this tracking going. So we looked a lot at what the industry itself studies and um, especially to use these dark patterns as it's now called, because they use these techniques basically to get these consent rates. So um, they basically use the interface they have um, to get from about 3% consent rate to 90, 95% consent rate in, in actual practice uh, versus what people really want. And a large part of that is, as I already mentioned, interface. Um, right now in Europe, that's the cookie banner that we all know, and that's so annoying and so kind of nerve wracking that everybody just, you know, clicks it. Um, and there's obviously one side of, of what we're doing, which is um, improving the, the user interface and, and going into this whole fairness, for example, debate on, on how the banner should be designed. Um, but that's one side of the point. It's not a long-term solution. We're gonna have then, I don't know, prettier cookie banners. Um, I think in the long run, what we need is, is this automated signal approach. And that was so far mainly coming out of the, sorry, there's this IP trade point right back there. Um, so there's a lot of these approaches coming out of the US that are super interesting. And I think from a technological standpoint, kind of what we need anyway, uh, the big difference in Europe is that we need an opt-in system and a big specialized and specific um, uh, consent for different purposes. So we need a kind of more advanced signal that kind of has these different uh, elements and Europe has opt-in and opt-out. So there's just much more uh, need to communicate different types of, of, of wishes of data subjects. And that's basically where we started ADPC as a kind of positive example, not just filing complaints about the status quo and, and violations of the GDPR or privacy, but also um, ADPC as an option, how this could be done. The big problem from our perspective is that we need to implement that somehow in European law. And obviously uh, the big um, question is here, if we can get a system like that into e-privacy, not necessarily ADPC for us, it's more of a prototype to show that something like that is doable. Um, but the process of having, for example, the EDPP somehow involved in deciding this is now the signal for Europe. And um, I think where especially um, our, the, the colleague from the US can probably come in more is um, the question of how we also can manage interoperability. So if you look, for example, at California, if you have a California customer as a European company, you also have to follow the California signal now. Um, under e-privacy, you have to follow the European signal. And there's a lot of these questions, how these jurisdictions would go together. And if we can find an, a system that is a bit more interoperable or a system of how to have as a company even the possibility to comply with, let's say 20 different signals that may appear in the future in the world. And I think that's also an interesting part of that. Um, as mentioned before, I need to hop on a train that's right back there. So I'd hand over for all the details to Alan, but I'm still gonna stay in the call and, and hopefully can join you later as well. All right, thank you so much, Max. And, and thank, I hope that you get your train okay. Um, I'm gonna direct the next question to Anna. Um, Max was talking about cookie banners there and how annoying they are. Um, we have the general data protection regulation, the GDPR now, and many thought that that was going to change everything for the better. Um, so why did these problems still persist? And what do you think is the role of the EDPS where you work in making it better? Thank you, Catherine, and uh, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be part of this, uh, of this discussion today. Um, well, very pertinent question, and, and Max is absolutely right when he voices the frustration or impatience with the current state of, uh, of, of cookie banners and, and you know, the, the interfaces or the, 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 the non-choices non that we are often presented with as, uh, as users of, uh, of websites and online services. Um, I think, um, it, you know, we've been looking at various um, technology solutions for many, many years now. Um, I think before we, we go into discussions how that specifically could work, it's also important to recognize that the legal framework that we have in the EU is really complicated. So indeed the GDPR 
I believe, clarified certain uh, aspects, such as conditions for valid consent, uh, certainly um, drew attention or increased public awareness of privacy and data protection issues, made people aware of, of, of the rights or, or uh, expectations that they may legitimately have. Um, unfortunately, uh, GDPR is still not the only instrument that, or unfortunately, fortunately, it, it's not the only instrument that is important in this, in this case, in this context. So the e-privacy directive is still there and it still applies as uh, essentially uh, Lex Specialis to the GDPR. Eh? We can have another discussion to what extent it really is as Lex Specialis, but bottom line is when it comes to setting cookies or using any other tracking technology that uh, you know stores information or accesses information on terminal equipment of users you look first and foremost at the e-privacy directive uh, requirements um, and this is where uh, the problem starts because as a directive um, a legacy instrument it has been trans transposed implemented uh, interpreted in quite diverse ways across Europe. And I think despite ongoing efforts, uh, notably from the side of the EDPB and the National Data Protection Authorities, we are not yet uh, at a point where we have um, a common, common understanding of the rules and that might never, <laughs> never really come. Uh, because of this uh, divergence uh, of, of transpositions and also of the fragmented enforcement landscape. So the fact that it's not always the data protection authorities who are uh, in charge or competent for the application and enforcement of those rules. So all that, I think, creates a very complex situation when it's hard to speak of a common clear operational set of rules that would be really easy to explain, to understand or to implement uh, across all the member states and beyond um, through technical solutions. And here, of course, uh, big hopes for the e-privacy regulation. I hope Peter will be able to tell us a bit more uh, about the status, state of play uh, uh, there. Um, but also, um, I think that we need to be mindful of the fact that, let's say, the societal consensus that certain tracking practices should be banned or limited um, and that that should be reflected in legislation is actually only emerging now in certain areas. Eh? So when it comes to political targeting, uh, targeting of minors, we see um, developments in the in the context of the DSA, the Digital Services Act. We see some proposals in the latest uh, elections package from the European Commission. But I think, to be fair, uh, there may also still be quite some way to go in creating this societal consensus that, in fact, certain of those practices should be considered illegal or und undesirable, and maybe we should strive for clearer legislation that that would actually address that for the future. Thank you, Anna. Sophie, you've worked on privacy issues in the Parliament for many years. Do you think that citizens have enough transparency, control and choice over how their data is collected and used for profit today? Well, <laughs> I think if you put that question to, to any person you meet on the streets, they will tell you, no, they don't have sufficient control and, and transparency. And it's interesting, uh, I heard uh, Anna say how uh, uh, societal consensus is, uh, is, is progressing, is developing. Uh, it always strikes me how the European Council, so that's the national government, how they are completely deaf and blind to signals coming from society, regardless of political color. Um, that, that's really remarkable. They always seem to feel that they have to represent the interests of industry. I don't know why that is. You'd say, you, you'd say that in council too, there would be different political views. Parliament is clearly a lot more uh, receptive to, to signals coming from uh, society. And the fact that the legislative processes take a long time uh, also mean that, that public opinion can change. 
Um, yes, we have indeed adopted a position as European Parliament on the e-privacy uh, uh, directive, like, yeah, I think it was 2017. Um, but I think a lot has happened since, and public opinion has changed since. We are, um, uh, we are, we are currently uh, negotiating, we started negotiations with the Council, um, but I, I have not yet seen that they are aware that public op opinion is changing, that people do not want, uh, or they, they do want, let's say, more control, more uh, transparency. And I think everybody has, has that, uh, that experience. And I remember when we were first drafting the parliament position on e-privacy that companies would come to us and say, no, no, you, we don't want these you know, privacy by default settings which is now the position of parliament. Uh, and then we said, no, but you know, if people want your tracking cookies, then they can, they can say so. And then um, the company said, yeah, but if we leave it to the people, they will always say no. <laughs> what, kind of, you know, what kind of business model is that? That it only works if you, if you twist somebody's arm. So uh, I'm pleased in conclusion that parliament uh, has listened to what people want. They want more control, they want more transparency, uh, and in the negotiations, we will be fighting for that. Thank you, Sophie. So I, I think the, the last three speakers have given us a pretty good picture of how things are looking in Europe today. We've got a complex legal structure, we have societal issues and public opinion that is that is changing and not in line necessarily with, with what people are experiencing today. Um, I'm gonna to pass now to Robin to ask a little bit about how things are in the United States. Um, Robin, you're based in New York, working for one of the most well-known US news publishers, the New York Times. Is the picture different in the US? How, how are things in the US on these issues today? Well, I mean, the, the obvious answer is that we don't have the GDPR and we don't have all the, all the, all the instruments that, that exist in, in Europe right now. Um, as you know, there's, there's a, a number of state level um, laws appearing here and there, but there's, there's nothing federal and, and there's definitely nothing as comprehensive um, as, as what's available in Europe. That being said, uh, it, it's, you know, as a, as a global publisher, we, we operate in, in, in both areas. And I, I don't feel that the situation for publishers is, is very different in both markets. Um, uh, the kind of, the, you know, the, the, the problems that we're trying to solve at the times um, are basically on, on one hand, trying to get like really better, seriously better privacy for our readers, um, you know, without being dragged down by, by industry practices, um, because we really, we really think that, that privacy is essential to, to trust and, and, you know, without trust, there's, there's nothing left for us. Um, and at the same time, uh, we also want to prevent third parties from, from, you know, using the data um, that they collect on our site in order to compete with us. So, you know, the way, the way we look at it, the, the privacy expectations of our readers and, and the business interests uh, of, of publishers are, are entirely aligned. Um, so, you know, as, as Sophie was mentioning, defending industry, but in my sense, industry needs more privacy. It needs more, more defense from, from tracking. Um, and so, so those two things really work together. But uh, as currently implemented, um, you know, with, with all the consent loopholes that, that we're seeing, um, the GDPR isn't actually helping much today with either of those problems. Um, and so, you know, it, it feels to me that we're very much in the, in the same boat um, and, and trying to solve, still trying to solve the, the same problems um, by, by testing different things. And so that's, you know, that, that's the point at which I think there's a lot of interesting activity going on, <clears throat> trying to to bridge, you know, technical solutions with legal solutions, um, and and you know, trying to get the the worlds of of you know technology and 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 and, and policy making to 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 work more closely together. And those things are very similar on both sides of the Atlantic. Max mentioned um, interoperability. There's a problem we have today. You know, if 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 we know that someone is a Californian and they're currently in Europe, we have to apply. Um, uh, both, both legal regimes um, at once, and so you know that's that's the kind of thing for which um, privacy controls uh, are, are really helpful. Um, making you know technical solutions that are at the same time legally binding. Um, so I'm I'm quite hopeful that that these these differences um, 
of 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 current, current differences of legal regime can can you know be be solved um, by by sort of bridging these worlds together. Thanks, Robin. So th these are issues really that span multiple geographies and, and jurisdictions, and we all need to work together to solve them. Um, Peter, you you lead the commission team focused on digital privacy in, in DG Connect, and one of your focus areas right now is e-privacy. Can you tell us a little bit about the commission's priorities when it comes to data protection, and where do you see gaps today? <clears throat> Thanks, uh, Kathleen, and good morning to everybody. Um, well, I can't talk about all the data protection issues that, at the commission. I think I can focus on what uh, DigiConnect uh, files are. And our um, our main topic is, of course, the privacy regulation and the legislative negotiation. But we're also coordinating with our colleagues, uh, dealing with other digital files like DSA, DMA, um, artificial intelligence, our cybersecurity colleagues, and so on. Um, on e-privacy, um, as, uh, as you know, we are in the trilogues. We haven't discussed yet these issues we are discussing today, uh, but we hope that will come soon because we, we hope to be able to close one, the chapter we have started with uh, very soon, and then we could hopefully move to one, to one of those important issues like, uh, like the cookies. Um, but by the way, cookies, maybe it's a very limited expression. I think the New York Times in its data protection declaration calls it trackers. And I think that is probably a more um, suitable expression because I think cookies, if you look at some data protection authorities' websites, it's maybe an out, uh, outdated concept because there are new and other issues, which of course should also be covered by the equivalent regulation. And that is also due to the long duration of the negotiations that commercial developments have happened, technological um, improvements have happened as the ones we are going to discuss today, um, which should be taken into account in the final compromise between uh, council and parliament. The commission's role in these trilogues is of course, somehow the, the, the honest broker to find uh, a deal between parliament and council. So we can't take a strong position uh, today, but I think what I can do is to, to explain a bit the um, the different uh, positions and the, the issues at, at stake, which we see should be addressed in the um, in the negotiations. As Anna explained, the privacy is um, is lex specialis to the to the GDPR. But on the other hand, the consent concept used in the privacy is the concept consent concept of the uh, GDPR. Therefore, we have this this interaction. Um, I think from from our perspective, the, um, one of the key issues is to address what really makes citizens unhappy is this, this cookie consent requests, the, the, the mere number of those requests, also the, the fact that those, some of those at least um, are not, or it's questionable whether they are compliant with GDPR, and then also the user friendliness of those uh, requests. I think these are issues which we want to address. And if there are technological solutions to address that, um, then I think that should be discussed between parliament and council. I think one important issue or element to be kept in mind is that also the council, both parliament and council say that, for instance, the individual consent granted by users um, should prevail over browser settings. And that is maybe a way of finding a common approach to, to these uh, issues we're going to discuss today. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Really interesting insights there. Um, I'm going to pass back to Robin for a moment because Robin, you've been, I know you've been very involved in work to create um, the global privacy control of the GPC in the US. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about GPC and how it would work? Um, sure. Um, basically, it, it, GPC is a very is designed to be a very simple signal for 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 in part for technical reasons. Um, one one thing that is is often uh, missed when when looking at GPC is that it's not designed to be California specific and it's not designed to be opt out specific. Um, in fact, the initial name. Of the um, of the of the standard was Spock for a single signal of preference for one controller, and the goal of GPC 
is really to make use of any available legal framework in order to get into a situation where we can you know, make the promise that the only entity that can determine means and purposes, the, the, the only controller, is the one that you as, 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 as a data subject know that you're interacting with. And so it's meant to remove you know, all the hidden uh, data controllers that you might have clicked OK to, but, but you really don't see. Um, and the one of the ideas behind GPC is that is that you know websites are, are, are really complex and so it's, it's fine to rely on, on, on other parties to provide some functionality to help to help you build it um, but there's absolutely no reason for these other parties to be able to reuse that data independently um, from, from from the website um, you know it's bad it's bad for privacy it's, it's bad for it's bad for business um, and so you know GPC just sends a very simple signal that the user has activated and the, the browser will continue sending it um, you know, with each and, and every request um, and but because the browser cannot tell the difference between which of those third parties are controllers and which are just processors um, it can't block them accordingly but by having a, a, a signal that's sent to all of them, um, with um, with a, you know with with a, a legal framework to back it to say that that third party controllers are are, are excluded uh, and that there should be just one controller that that the data subject is dealing with, um, then then this you know this, this sort of bridge between between a simple technical signal um, that that's sending this this one message um, and the legal framework uh, sort of enforces this single controllership uh, um, notion. Hey, thank, thanks, Robin. And the, so the global privacy control, the GPC, has some similarities to the, the ADPC, the Advanced Data Protection Control um, a program that, that Max and, and Alan have been working on. Um, Alan, can you tell us a little bit more about ADPC and how, 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 would it, how would it address the issues that everyone has just been outlining in the first part of this discussion? Yeah, happy to. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I should say at the outset that I'm a consultant to none of your business, so <clears throat> my remarks should be treated as being personal views as opposed to being the official policy of NOYB. I think um, just at the outset, I think it's important to underline that this is a complicated problem, uh, which has many different components. And, you know, so what we're discussing here is one part of that. Um, but I'm not saying that it's going to be a silver bullet. So, you know, the part of um, you know, data protection that I'm most intimately familiar with is the interactions with the advertising companies. And so there, there's going to be questions about what happens in the browser, what, you know, what way the user is empowered. It's also about, you know, what about publishers' practices. It's also about what are the technical possibilities for ad tech companies in terms of the environment that they operated in. So you've got all of these different moving parts. And I think any type of serious regulatory solution needs to take those different components into consideration and look for a holistic response. So that having said that, let's talk about advanced data protection control. So I won't go into the uh, real dirty details. Anybody who's uh, curious can um, look at the documentation on the website, dataprotectioncontrol.org. And um, there is a fairly full specification there. Um, our objective with this was to define a language for communication, a machine readable communication between the user and a data controller that is seeking consent, or between a user who wishes to object to the processing of their data on the basis of legitimate interest, and that they want to send that to the data controller. So we think that once you've defined that common framework of communication, then there are other things that you can do so as to make the user experience better. So ADPC in itself is really this specification, this communication specification. And then, uh, so I'll talk about that for a moment and then um, make a few remarks with regard to some of the things that we believe can be built on top of that so as to improve the user experience and address some of the other components of the problem. So ADPC is a two-way uh, process whereby the um, user uh, calls a website, the website responds with a series of 
requests, uh, consent requests for purposes that it seeks uh, permission for. Um, this is, uh, you know, in contrast with say, do not track or GPC, the European situation is more complex because of the fact that the uh, decisions that users need to make are not binary. Um, they're not, uh, yes, I want to be tracked or no, I don't want to be tracked or yet do not sell my data or do not sell or do sell my data. Yeah, there, are, there can be many different purposes that are requested. So each of the data controller or the website's purposes, they must be given uh, uh, an identifier that uh, identifies those purposes uniquely. Those are sent to the user, and then the user responds by saying, I consent to purpose one or purpose two or purpose three, or I withdraw or rather reject my consent for purposes two, three, four, and seven. Um, and I object, if the person wishes to do that, to any processing of my data um, for direct marketing purposes. So, so the, the site receives uh, this uh, set of user instructions as part of that exchange. And those instructions are sent throughout the communication between the user and the website. So they're always there, they're persistent. And um, if a consent has been given, they may be associated also with a cookie that has been placed on the user's machine. But it will be effectively, though, the consent information in the header, which uh, instructs the data controller as to whether they have permission to process any of that data, whether they need to uh, wipe that data, to delete that data, whether consent has been withdrawn on it. Um, we think that uh, the, uh, the ADPC on the user's side should be the single source of truth with regard to whether the user has provided consent or not. And so that means that this is the only place that a, a user needs to look. It should be noted, by the way, that the communication between the user um, and the website is only that main site that the user is visiting. So for example, if they are visiting the New York Times, then you know, the New York Times may use a whole series of third parties in order to provide services on the site, but the communication with the user will be conducted exclusively with the New York Times. And it's up to the New York Times to then manage the relationships with, with all of its own, all of its third parties. Okay, so, so that's the basic structure, the framework for communication. What can you do once you have that in place? It's because that in itself only defines a language, right? It doesn't address the fundamental problems that we're facing, which are that users just face too many of these requests. The complexity of these requests is also too much for them to be able to deal with. They are usually also not online in order so as to manage their privacy on every individual site that they visit, they have their own purposes. And so in these sort of situations, when faced with these requests, they have to rely upon some sort of a heuristic. A heuristic is simply, right, I mean, a series of mental shortcuts that we use so as to make existence tolerable without having to think about things you know, endlessly. So I mean, in, in the current situation where we're overwhelmed with information, we don't have the knowledge to be able to process it correctly in terms of the consent requests. I think that what we end up doing a lot of the time is we end up hitting what I call the whatever button, which is to say, you know, I don't have the energy to think about this. So just like get me out of here. So what we're doing here is like, I mean, actually creating a situation of learned helplessness on the side of the user and de degrading basically the value actually of the consent choice. So we need to look at ways in which to, to address that. It should be that like, I mean, when a consumer is faced with a choice, they can do what they do in other parts of the market. They develop ideas. So, you know, I mean, if you want to buy a car, you know, you know it, it may not be quite as simple as this, but you can decide whether you want to buy electric or diesel. But this is not the, quite, this is not the choice that we have when we're confronted with 600 or 400 potential processes of our data on any given site without knowing where our data is going to end up. So all that said, those are all the problems with the, with the, with the given situation. We think that on top of this, um, of the ADPC specification, you can build other things that make users' life easier and lighten the load upon them. So one of those is what we refer to as uh, smart management. So this could mean that like the request to users for their consent are only surfaced once a given threshold has been 
uh, met. Now, those would be rules that would be specified by the user. If you visit a site once in a year, you know, I mean, it is very unlikely that you have any interest in trusting them unless you just don't care. You know, whereas if you are visiting a local newspaper three or four times a week, you do care about this website and it's reasonable also that they should have more uh, possibilities to be able to solicit, um, you know, what, the, what they want from you, whether that's, you know, a subscription or whether it's asking you to, you know, agree to the use of their, of your data because they're trustworthy actors and they can promise you that, you know, that uh, your uh, data will be used in a responsible way and, um, and, you know, that it will be financing something that you believe is valuable. So that's one aspect. It's these type of smart management things where you can actually guide uh, the requests that are exposed to you. And perhaps also you can use presets so as to answer um, specific uh, purpose requests. So if you're not concerned, for example, um, you know, uh, you know, if, if you're okay with the capturing of your data by a single site, as long as it's not going to be shared, then you may agree to do that. And you may say that's always okay, or you may not. Um, other, another thing that we think is very uh, interesting to build upon this is the idea of bulk lists. So we think that you shouldn't have to deal with every site individually, but you should also be able to trust other parties in order so as to be to do some of your thinking for you, at least initially, it's sort of like, I mean, should we say a first filter? So good examples of this could be that in the area of quality news, uh, national uh, newspaper associations could uh, offer a bulk list of the titles that are members of the association and perhaps can uh, conver converge on a series of agreed practices with regard to the use of user data and so on and make that available and make an argument also to users that in order um, for uh, news media to continue to be published uh, and financed that, um, that, that users should import and agree to the uh, controllers and purposes contained in that. Other people could do the same thing. Uh, that could be uh, none of your own business or none of your business um, uh, could produce a list or uh, you know, other uh, advertisers associations could produce a list. So but th this in some way refers back to what I mentioned at the beginning, which was that this is a problem with multiple different components. And so part of that, that part of the component of that part of the problem needs to be addressed by different groups of publishers or marketers uh, coming together and agreeing on standardized uh, practices. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ellen. I'm just going to jump in here because I want to pick up on a couple of things that you've said. Um, and I want to go back to Robin, um, because from some of the things you've been describing, I mean, it's it seems like the, the GPC in the US has some similarities to ADBC, but really the big difference here is that the signal that Robin's working on in the US is legally binding. Um, so I wanted to just ask Robin, how how important, and, and to you as well, actually, Alan, how important is it, do you think, to have these provisions enforced in law and legally binding? I, I mean, I think it's absolutely vital uh, without, without, you know, without the, the law to back it up, it, it just doesn't work. Um, uh, you know, as, as Alan was saying, I really love the whatever button thing. Uh, we're dealing with very strong asymmetries of automation. Um, and so the idea is that we need we need to get something in the user's corner in order to push back and balance back uh, how much you know have some automation work for the user. Um, and you know we tried this with DNT in the past. I think some of us have have you know burning memories of of just how atrocious that that process was. I've been in the standard space for a long time, and it remains one of the worst uh, standardization processes that most people have gone through. Um, and it didn't work because it was it was ignorable, right? Um, and so one of the things that it, it is key to to the GPC approach and and to the ADC approach uh, as well um, is that the, the browser can only do so much. It, it can work for the user, but it it cannot you know make people comply with things. And that's where there's this collaboration between between the browser solution and and and, and a legal framework um, to to make it actually enforceable. And you know, GPC is enforceable under the CCPA. I think you know, it, it, there's I think there's solid legal ground to say that 
it could um, it could uh, reference uh, Article Seven and, and Twenty One of the GDPR to, to be enforceable in Europe as well. Um, but you really need those teeth. Uh, otherwise, it's just it's just you know a signal of preference that everyone can ignore. Thanks, Robin. Alan, do you want to come in briefly on that point around legally binding? Yes, I do. I think that um, it's. It's just absolutely essential. I don't think that we can overstate the importance of this. The reality is that the previous methods to solve this problem, which didn't rely upon legally binding measures, failed. And they didn't fail by accident, right? So, I mean, you know, on the one hand, you had do not track. That signal was supported by all of the major browsers. Websites have been receiving it, you know, billions and billions of times since 2011. Only a tiny, tiny number of websites agreed to uh, voluntarily observe that request. Most of them simply ignored it. So that was the voluntary approach. The self-regulatory approach was what Robin referred to, the process that happened at the World Wide Web Consortium. There, a group was founded in late 2011 to work out uh, both technical and policy details for how Do Not Track could work. Many of the participants in that process did not really have any interest in achieving a successful result because every day that nothing happened was a good day for them. It was a day when their practices were able to be to continue without being encumbered by, you know, uh, by the, the, the nuisance of the law or, or, or of, 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 you know, of some sort of agreed policy. Um, you know, they... Uh, <laughs> In those seven years, I was, I was uh, fortunate or unfortunate enough to participate in that process myself for three years. There was 17,000 emails sent as part of this, uh, as, as part of this negotiation. Um, but really, uh, th there's a lesson in this as well, which I guess we'll come back to later on in terms of, you know what I mean, the future, which is that there's a lot of, there's a cautionary tale there about also how you run a process when you're looking for an effective outcome. Um, but look, you know, the, the attempt to find a self-regulatory solution of the W3C, it didn't work. The voluntary uh, request to uh, websites not to track users, that didn't work. Legal uh, requirements, binding signals is the only solution to this problem. Thanks, Alan. Peter, I'm going to pass over to you now because, um, as the previous speakers have pointed out, you know EU law doesn't doesn't make this legally binding now. But actually, the Commission's draft proposal on e-privacy did have some ideas in it around indicating privacy preferences through software settings, for example. Can you tell us a bit more about what the idea was there, and how would you have seen it working with some of the types of solutions that have just been described by Alan and Robin? Yeah, I think these were very interesting uh, explanations by Alan and, and Robin. So um, what the Commission had proposed in its uh, Article 10 um, was, let's say the concept was that the user would be confronted when installing a, a browser to make a choice whether they would generally accept or reject uh, cookies. Um, and then these settings by the user, they would have be binding for any kind of websites. Um, the binding effect was only in a recital. Um, the parliament in its uh, uh, text went further and also made the binding effect in, in, the, in the article, but Sophie will be able to explain that in, in more detail. The council um, abolished the full article 10. Um, at the same time, the council also has a recital which says that whitelisting, I think that's something Alan and, and Robin have been referring to, um, is is something which uh, which should be possible so that a, um, a, a controller or a company can be uh, because the user trusts them can be uh, can be granted consent for for their their cookies and, and other uh, identifiers. Um, so that may be a way to, to to open discussions between Parliament and Council to find something which is, may not be the same as the Commission's uh, could be a way of discussing and possibly agreeing on some issues of these kind of signals. But that is, of course, just one possible way, way forward, but it has to be seen with the, with the council. I think one of the concerns which should also be addressed 
and which was raised by some member states is that the browsers should not get the kind of gatekeeper uh, power. I think that's a legitimate concern. Whether this is an, a real or an actual issue in this whole setting, that is something one has to further explore and, and discuss. But I think it's something to be kept in mind. Um, I think I have maybe two or one comment, uh, more comment on the, I think Alan explained that the user would only deal with the consent, consent and, the, and the settings with, uh, with respect to the, let's say the, the main counterpart, the, 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 the publisher with whom they are dealing. But the publisher would then deal with all the third parties which are somehow interacting with, the, uh, with that publisher. I think that's a good approach and that's probably the approach as it is in some of the jurisprudence on, on GDPR consent. I think the court has a similar approach. And I think what is important is that the, um, let's say the, 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 the publisher actually enforces also the user's choice vis-a-vis -vis the third parties uh, with whom the publisher is, uh, is dealing. Because if once the data has been passed on to, to a third party by the publisher and there is no control anymore by the publisher over what the third party partners are doing with that data, I think then there's of course a problem. And I'm just wondering whether that's, I mean, I'm sure you have spent some thoughts about how that could be addressed um, because I think that's an important issue and could be a weak side of, um, of, of, of the system, but um, I'm interested in seeing what, how that could be addressed. Million, thanks, Peter. Alan, do you want to come back briefly on that? Um, well, with regard to uh, the third parties, <clears throat> I mean, one uh, assumes that, you know, <clears throat> I guess there are two aspects to that. One is that um, the publisher can either take technical steps in order to prevent that data from reaching the third parties in the first place. Um, so uh, I think there's, there's quite a bit of experience out there actually already on this front. Um, the other part, which is more, it sounds simple, but of course it's not because market dynamics intervene in it, which is about the contractual relationships between the publisher and the third parties. When we describe it like this, it sounds like the publisher is the big one and the third parties are the small ones and that therefore the publisher can dictate terms. But in fact, very often publishers are not the big ones and they're dealing with much bigger companies who have standard form contracts and who are unwilling to vary those um, in order also so as to assist publishers in making good on their privacy promises to their users. Uh, publishers, of course, have a different type of uh, interest in terms of keeping relationship good with users, because as Robin mentioned, the trust that a newspaper has, for example, is central to its operation. Whereas these ad tech companies, the vast majority of them, none of, nobody knows their names. Most normal users don't know their names. I mean, they, I mean, <clears throat> you know, and the, the ones where they do know their names, like the Googles and the Facebooks, are such commercial colossi in this area that one crosses them somewhat at one's own peril. You know, one hears these type of discussions sometimes from ad tech people who are very, you know, they're very critical of the platforms, but they don't like to be so public about it. I see Max, by the way, gesturing, he's dying to get in. Thanks, I'll give it a short I'll probably try to give it a short time to see how much German infrastructure works in having Zoom calls with 200 kilometers an hour while you're overtaken by cars next on the autobahn to the uh, fast track. So anyways, um, the one thing that I really want to highlight is the big problem that we have is we need also a system of how to implement a specific standardization that was not mentioned so far. We have in Article 21 of the GDPR, we have a binding signal, so to say, uh, for opt-outs, but it's simply not defined who who is going to define it, what the signal is going to be. I'm going to be in a tunnel, it's going to be off. So um, I think that's a crucial question for e-privacy that we get a system up and running there um, on how we define that signal. I think as it's still working, um, in e-privacy, the really interesting part would be that we at least have uh, red lines for the legislator and then somebody that makes that decision of what the ultimate signal is. Thank you, Max. Um, Sophie, I'd, I'd like to move the, the discussion on to, onto you now. Um, Peter, though, was, was talking about the, the Parliament position on e-privacy and, and the negotiations that are ongoing. How do you see this point evolving in the e-privacy negotiations in the future? Oh, 
Well, that's it's hard to say. Uh, as Peter said, I think the positions of council and parliament are very far apart, and there's just uh, no way of predicting uh, how it will how it will evolve. Uh, if if maybe the council, despite the fact that they've taken a very tough position, uh, uh, that they are listening to what people actually want, and they will they will be more willing to compromise. But that would be uh, the first time in my experience. Um, fortunately, Parliament had a we 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 took position not with a very broad majority as we usually do, but a, a narrower majority, centre left. So the the position of Parliament is is pretty is pretty strong on on the rights of users. Basically, um, the council is going to try and and take all of that out. Um, but maybe maybe um, the kind of things that have just been proposed could serve, you know, maybe on that basis, we can find practical solutions that would serve both sides a little bit. But uh, I do not think that we're going to, to, to come up with a with the perfect uh, solution. But I think some of what has been said could serve as a uh, as a basis for a compromise, I hope. Thank you, Sophie. And Anna, where do you sit that see this fitting in to EU law from your perspective? Do you think this is workable? And I mean, how could overall could it contribute to better privacy for citizens if it was somehow integrated into the law? Uh, well, thank you, Catherine. Actually, your question for me is, is very spot on. So I, I came to this discussion thinking, you know, we really need this is a very promising technology, uh, but it can only work if we can if we can make it work kind of hand in hand with uh, clear binding legislation that is also privacy and data protection enhancing. Eh? Um, at the same time, the more I'm listening to, um, to the presentation about the details, how it all could potentially work. And at the same time, uh, we all realize that, well, the current situation, legally speaking, is very fragmented uh, and tricky. And, and, you know, the prospects for for improvements in the short to medium term might be uh, limited. Um, maybe actually we should we should focus instead on, on, on what Sophie was saying, what could we achieve in practical terms by rolling out this kind of solution and making them widely available and convincing maybe ideally some of the bigger players on the market uh, to adopt them in the first place and to promote them and commit publicly to uh, to respecting them. Um, I still think that in terms of um, the promise of what we could achieve through technology in terms of legal compliance, we should be uh, more precise maybe with what we mean. For example, and I see that a similar question was already asked in, in, uh, in writing. Um, I can perfectly imagine that um, browser settings or, or signals or this kind of, of, of technology could be used to signal opt out or objection. But it is not entirely clear to me how a publisher or let alone, you know, a further remote third party could be then able to prove that they have obtained informed consent on the basis of settings that have been expressed maybe in bulk on the basis of a list of, um, uh, of, of controllers, you know, who we, then we will get into the whole discussion, what, who is the controller and maybe first and foremost, what the consent is actually about. And here it really boils down to currently in the current state of the law to the distinction or the interplay as we call it in our EDPB opinion, interplay between the e-privacy and the GDPR eh, where e-privacy really talks, basically speaks to the setting of the cookie or, you know, storing information on the equipment or retrieving information from the terminal equipment, whichever technology uh, that might actually be in practice, while subsequent processing. So all the, the you know, profiling, targeting and, and whatever takes place later on, in general, as a rule of thumb is, uh, for the GDPR. Eh? And this interplay is really very tricky to sort out in, in practice. Um, but uh, unfortunately, until we have a better 
system also in terms of competent authorities and enforcement. It has to be really closely analyzed by everyone who is uh, who is trying to 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 um, address these rules through technical solutions. And also on a related note, if I just may, um, I realized that uh, well, among the, the with the EDPB based on specific cases or more in general, I mean, a lot of work has been ongoing for many, many years to um, to align the approaches to sort out this interplay conundrum um, to work out how to go about enforcing the rules in countries where there is a, a split competence between DPAs and, and NRAs or what have you. Um, there is also a lot of discussion about the legal basis that should apply. So, for example, under the privacy for the cookie setting as a mental shortcut, this is generally consent uh, with some exceptions. There have been and still is some doubt as to the same should then apply for subsequent processing under the GDPR for the kind of, you know, profiling, targeting, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It seems to me that, at least from the perspective of the EDPS and um, a growing number of uh, DPAs, the consensus seems to be emerging that that subsequent processing should, in principle, also be based on consent. This is yet another point of contention, possibly on the you know on, for the the new e-privacy regulation. The logic being that if for the you know for the initial use of let's say the technology such as cookie you need consent, then obviously it would kind of defeat the purpose if you can subsequently do all sorts of intrusive, intrusive stuff on the basis of, let's say, legitimate interest. And so this is something where we continue to, to have discussions and we would hope to get some kind of, you know, commitment or clarity uh, more globally that this would be the preferred approach. But of course, that would have consequences for the frame, framing of the tools such as yours under uh, Article 21. Eh? Which is, which is limited to only certain legal basis. So all this to say that, you know, the complexity uh, that we have mentioned uh, at the beginning in terms of the applicable legal framework is probably really, really great. And we probably only scratched the surface of, of how far uh, the technology can be matched with the law as it currently, currently is. Thanks, Anna. Sophie, would you, would you like to come in there? Yes, because uh, I think it, what, what Anna just said underlines a little bit the, the problem. Sometimes we have to reconcile the irreconcilable. <laughs> and then uh, in the good uh, European tradition, we come up with a, you know, with fudge, with a, a solution that no, nobody really fully understands, but it seems to serve everybody's purpose. But then further down the line, we find out that it wasn't such a good idea. We, we run into trouble. Uh, I think if you if you think about cookie banners, the, the idea behind it was actually uh, to give people more control. Well, you know, look look how that ended. Um, so I think we at some point we just also have to make political choices, uh, and that's always very difficult. And if you see uh, when we're talking about e-privacy, the 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 huge gap between what the council wants and what Parliament wants. Uh, and I, I, I think ultimately, if we stick to the, the simple terminology of you know, the notion of opt in or opt out, uh, opt in and, and having privacy settings by default, I mean, that's a that's a political choice. It's a clear choice. Uh, but I'm afraid that, you know, reality dictates that we're going to end up with uh, with the, the usual uh, bricolage uh, to uh, to put it in, uh, in, in in Belgian French. But um, it, it would be much more helpful if we have clear political choices because it's not, you know, very often it's not a technical issue. It's a political issue trying to serve uh, different sides rather than, uh, than, than taking, uh, taking a stance. And something else I think that we also need to be mindful of is that the, the intention of the legislators is, uh, is very important. Uh, and that is what's in the recitals of legislation. Uh, that it's not the operative text, it's the, it's the intention. And that is, I mean, now that we're having this debate, I will be even more uh, vigilant that as we're going to, to, to negotiate the final text, that the, all the necessary recitals are there, which will allow the data protection authorities and the courts to, uh, to interpret 
the legislation in the right way. Thanks, Sophie. I think I think what's coming through from what a lot of people are saying is that what's really, really important here is is ensuring that whatever solution is is written down in a piece of law, that this really works in practice and is actually successful. So, Robin, I think it sounds like maybe the GPC is going to be the first sort of test case for proving the concept of, of legally binding privacy signals. So what will you and others be looking for to judge its success? I mean, it, 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 you know, success depends on the timescale we're, we're looking at. Uh, uh, this is something that as publishers, we really, really need. Um, I think Alan has, has explained quite well that, that you know, there's, there's this expectation that we, we actually have control over what third parties do on our site. And, and most of the time, that's, that's not true. Um, we, we are rarely in a position to, to negotiate terms that are favorable either to us or to, to our users. Um, and so, you know, one of the things very instrumentally is that improvements in, 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 in privacy really help uh, for us improvements in, in business and in, in making sure that we, we, we you know, can, can prevent leakage of, of our audience data. Um, and so, you know, long term, um, the long term, the success would be that we don't have to care about this. I mean, ideally, um, there would be a political decision such that that this kind of leakage, this kind of like third party data controller is quite simply illegal. Um, and then, then the success would be that we don't need GBC anymore. We don't, we don't need the, the signal because it, it's simply illegal. Um, in the shorter term, I think uh, success would be driven by adoption. And so for these signals, adoption is slightly complicated because they need to be adopted in, in, on the technical side and on the legal side at the same time. So there's a bit of a dance there. Um, but I think we're... GPC is looking is looking good in terms of in terms of that dance. Um, it's already supported in in two browsers, and Mozilla is currently adding support. It's supported by multiple um, consent management platforms. Um, it's supported on New York Times, Washington Post, and a bunch of other websites. Um, and it's it, it's it's legally binding in in California and being discussed in a, in a number of other jurisdictions. So you know, success is 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 definitely in the shorter term trying to build on on that adoption um, traction and 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 working with others. And you know, we 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 do talk with the ADPC folks. Um, and and try to exchange experiences to to help each other out. So I, I think trying to figure out also some alignment between various signals and various approaches is something that that um, it, it could could look like a could look very promising in the future as well. Thanks, Robin. Max, what's next for ADPC then? What's needed to make that a success in Europe? Um, I think what we need is basically. Um, especially coming from a kind of democratic view um, as a support in law. I personally don't care much if, if some browser wants or doesn't want to support it. If there's a legal requirement to do so, um, they will have to. And I think um, also getting back to what Anna said before, there is tons of, of these issues that I would echo 100%. Um, but I think the question of how we communicate consent is, is its own issue. And I think the um, specification we put forward answers all the questions we had before you can basically get these signals you can um you can prove that you can save them just as well as a cookie banner it just gets it out of this crazy cookie banner idea and we could move forward from that issue and i i think last but not least if we think about that being a democratic process i mean obviously the big counterpart here is the publishing industry in europe to a large extent that just has power over politics because there are the news and no politician ever wants to go against the news. Um, and that's, I think, to a large extent, the reality. But if we look at what people, how people reacted, for example, to, to our cookie banner complaints or this ADPC proposal, we never got as many positive emails or new membership and all these other things you can count than we paid when we, when we addressed that topic. And I think that is um, something that everybody knows is that the current system is not really working. Um, and we could rather easily shift to a new system. It's technically um, not such a huge challenge. It's, it's rather simple compared to what you think what all these companies do otherwise. Um, and all we need is basically a couple of lines and a law to make it happen to a large extent. And I think that that is doable. 
Thanks, Max. All we need is a couple of lines in the law. I love that. Um, Sophie, tell us about enforcement then. How, how would we ensure that the, if we there are a couple of lines in the law, how do we ensure that enforcement of those lines is effective and actually really works in practice? Well, I'm, I'm still laughing. We're just, we just need a couple of lines in the law. Uh, I, you know, I would be uh, over the moon if, if it worked like that. And we're certainly, um, you know, certainly after this debate, we're going to, to try and see uh, how we can, uh, how we can, how we can achieve that. But it's, um, it's, it's not easy. But enforcement is another, another matter. Uh, and I've just this week had a, uh, a slightly, uh, um, let's say, an animated uh, exchange with the Irish DPA. Uh, over the issue of enforcement, because I think the system that we have built in Europe, this decentralized system with uh, national DPAs uh, overseeing the application of European laws doesn't work, not for data protection and not in any other policy area. I think that is clear, whether you're talking about diesel emissions or fighting money laundering or the rule of law or state aid, uh, and, and that also applies to uh, to data protection. Um, I think the one-stop shop doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, and that's a big problem because it means that we have, we have based the whole system on, uh, on a chain. And if you have one weak link, then the chain is weak or, or even broken. Uh, and that's increasingly a problem. And I know Parliament has expressed worries about enforcement already a couple of months after the entry into force of the GDPR uh, and we're, you know, what we're what three and a half years down the line now and, and we are beginning to see that it is indeed uh, very problematic. Uh, the enforcement is very uneven, but then the establishment of uh, tech giants, for example, is also very uneven. So um, I, I think that the, the debate about having uh, strong European level oversight, I mean, that debate will come. But then before we achieve something like that, we, um, you know, it's going to take a long time, but I'll, I'll be pushing for that because I think national enforcement is, uh, is, is insufficient. Thanks, Sophie. Um, so looking towards the future then, Peter, what regulatory or, or indeed non-regulatory interventions do you think are needed in the future to give people more control over their digital privacy? Well, I think for the, for the time being, we are focusing on the legislative issues. I think for us, the top priority is the privacy regulation that it gets adopted. I think one of the shortcomings of the directive amongst many others is that the enforcement powers of the author competent authorities are very rather weak compared to those they have under the GDPR. Of course, as Sophie just explained, even if the powers are there, there's an issue of how they are applied. Um, but, um, but I think this is one of the, of the, the shortcomings of the, uh, of the directive. The other one is the coherence of the application because since it's a directive, it has been implemented into uh, national law uh, in very different ways. Uh, my home country uh, has, I think, complied only after more than 10 years now with uh, some parts of the, of the, of the privacy uh, directive. Um, so I think they are, they are, for us, the focus is on the privacy regulation, getting it adopted. And with respect to the issue we discussed today, I think we, we of course, well, very closely with our colleagues working on the DSA and DMA, because there are parallel strands going on. We will see what the parliament will adopt uh, in the next week. Um, but uh, this will be a discussion which is ongoing. But whatever will be in DSA on certain practices being banned or being, being, being limited, um, the discussion we had today on consent and user choice under e-privacy and in combination with GDPR, that will remain, that will not disappear whatever happens in DSA and DMA. So for the time being, I think we, our focus will be on continuation and conclusion of the legislative, the pending legislative files. And then we will have to see what non-legislative uh, actions may be needed at, at the later stage. Thanks, Peter. Sophie, do you want to come in there?
Yes, too many things popping up on my screen. Uh, no, I forgot one element, uh, and that is, of course, if uh, if the national authorities do not, uh, you know, properly apply uh, the well any EU law, but a GDPR or the Privacy Directive, then of course it is the task of the European Commission to enforce, uh, to start infringement proceedings, and to put pressure on the member states. And there. We have a big, big, big problem, and I'm, I'm not looking at anybody in particular, of course, because I know within the Commission there are also different views. But we can we can see it's you know objectively uh, it, it's 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 measurable, it's quantifiable that enforcement has been in steep decline across all the policy areas over the last 15 years or so, uh, and this is also one of our frustrations that we see that there is an issue with. Uh, with the application of GDPR in practice, and the European Commission is not enforcing, it's not taking action, uh, you know, up to the point of dereliction of duty. Uh, and this is, this is also part of the whole governance and enforcement system. Uh, and of course, this is a question to be answered by the, the political level in the European Commission, but this is, this is a, a big problem. Thanks, Sophie. And Anna, what are, what are your thoughts on this? How do we, how to ensure that this stuff works on an ongoing basis? And what do you think is the role of the EDPS in ensuring that regulatory provisions in this space are fit for purpose ongoing? Thank you. Well, I'm not sure we should really focus on the role of, of the EDPS, which is, you know, I believe we, we have a role, but it is somewhat limited. Eh? So we continue to uh, we continue together with the EDPB, by the way, to watch very closely the uh, EPR uh, negotiations and the process there, and we continue to, to explain why it's essential that this, this law is, uh, is adopted. Of course, not in whatever form and, and in whatever shape and at any cost. Eh? So here, I think I would also like to go back to, to the first um, comments. Uh, that Peter, you made uh, recognizing that that of course times have changed and technology has evolved and maybe user expectations have also evolved since the initial draft. So one thing would be, of course, to push for consensus, um, acceptable consensus between the Council and the Parliament, but also let's make sure that the text is still fit on purpose. Eh? It's it's fit for purpose. It's probably not not good enough what was drafted with the best intentions back in 2017 or 2016 um, to really address the issues that we are, have been discussing here today. So it, it would be extremely important to have a close look also to make sure that the, in particular, that the language is technology neutral eh, in the sense to, to also allow to, to connect or underpin the solutions that we've been dis discussing here today. And then indeed the other big question is, is the enforcement. Um, whatever we say or think about how the one-stop shop uh, functions and the, the GDPR, I will come to that in a, in a second. Um, I think the e-privacy directive also shows that in any event, this kind of hybrid competence by which different types of groups of competent authorities are given the powers to enforce is simply something that is not workable. So I would also say that this needs to be avoided in the in the new uh, e-privacy regulation if we want to have a chance to 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 get some improvements and then um indeed i think we should we should watch closely the the discussions in the context of the dsa dma maybe the elections package maybe some other regulations that that will come and 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 maybe we will get a chance or to to, to have clear rules for some kind of certain kinds of processing or targeting or tracking or whatever you call it uh, that will be incrementally added uh, to the general uh, baseline that we have in the um, in the GDPR plus uh, plus the privacy uh, protections for uh, for terminal equipment and um, and all that and um, I would also like to to thank you Sophie for your last remark um, which, which indicates that there are more stakeholders who have, uh, who have to become active in this space. Um, and and uh, problems with enforcement cannot 
always all be blamed on the failures of the data protection authorities or or the edpb as a body um i mean there is really um, a lot of a lot of work and and a lot of commitment on the edpb side to to deliver but there are objective limitations to to the entire system and and um certainly um, the role of the commission and, and also scrutinizing very closely how the member states have transposed certain rules how it's being implemented on the ground um, how the the authorities really function uh, looking specifically at the issue of um, um, administrative procedure and other rules other laws that have a very uh, strong impact on how how the cooperation can or cannot work cross-border. Uh, this is something that we have so far not seen um, a lot, but, uh, but it is important and it has to happen. And I would also, if I may like to um, let you know that, that also within the EDPB community, let's say, and from the side of the EDPS, um, we are looking at how things, um, where things stand in terms of enforcement of the GDPR. Um, it's obviously not all bleak. Huh? There is there is quite a lot of decisions coming out of the one-stop shop as well, even though um, obviously they tend not necessarily to concern the biggest players, uh, some of which they have mentioned, uh, were mentioned here. Uh, today, um, and in any in any event, uh, we believe that it's it's about time to take stock of where we stand and what could be improved through which ways in the shorter term, in the medium term, or maybe to envisage different solutions for enforcement in the longer term. And to this end, the supervisor is um, organizing a conference in June next year, so 16th, 17th of June, 2022 hopefully in person, presential in Brussels, um, if the circumstances allow. And um, we would certainly hope to have uh, a continuation of, of also this discussion, possibly about the, the contribution of technology and technology tools uh, to support uh, better enforcement of data protection legislation in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so June next year in Brussels. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Anna. So mark your calendars, 16th uh, to 17th of June. It sounds like that will be a really interesting continuation of, of many of the points that have been raised in, in today's discussion. Um, I'm really keen to make sure that we, we have a little bit of time at the end for questions. I can already see that we're starting to get some questions through in the Q&A box. If you have a burning question that you are desperate to ask, please feel free to type it in the Q&A box now and we'll try to get to it before we end. I guess I have one final question, which I'd like to direct to either Max, if, if he's available on his train or if not to Alan, which is, you know, what, what would be your final message to, to European policymakers on these issues and what, what do European policymakers need to be doing to make projects like these workable and effective in the future? I'm trying this super quick again. Um, I think, at this, as I mentioned before, I think um, there's a lot of, I mean, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of this kind of Brussels bubble reasons why things can possibly not happen. I think that was partly a reason why we tried the ADPC approach is to show actually technically this is doable. This is not that complicated. This could actually, as, as, as Robin has mentioned before, be rather beneficial for a lot of the industry as well. I think that um, mindset is probably what we need for this project specifically. Um, I also want to echo everything that, that Anna has said before on the enforcement issues and so on and, and, and Sophie as well. Um, but I think for, for what the question for this call is, which is the, how can we get, you know, so to say over the cookie banners. Uh, there are now proposals on the table and they may be improved or maybe you know, done better, um, but it's generally a doable thing. And I think if we think that you know, about 3% of people actually want to con consent to stuff, then there is also kind of a, a mandate to get that somehow done, <laughs> that that is also met in reality and is, is, is doable and, and the, the right people get together. That, that is probably what, we would ourselves hope for. 
All right. Th thank you so much, so much, Max. And and I'm I'm glad that you've made it through your journey safely. You look like you're you're off the train now. So thank you for bearing with us uh, as you've been traveling. Um, I'm going to switch over to some of the questions that are coming through now in the in the Q and A. Um, one quite interesting uh, one quite interesting question that's come through is is a question about wouldn't signals like the ADPC or GPC suffer some of the same flaws? that we've seen in other um, technology tools that are supposed to be designed to help enforce privacy or um, legal requirements within the ad tech ecosystem. So I think the question here is specifically about the, the transparency and consent framework, the TCF, which was developed by um, the advertising industry, by the IAB specifically, in order to transmit signals about people's consent preferences when it comes to um, data being shared for advertising purposes. The, so the question is, wouldn't the ADPC and GPC serve similar flaws to this? Um, to enforce that the signal is complied with by all of the different ad tech participants of which there are there are a lot. Alan, you've worked a lot on advertising technology issues. Can you talk a little bit about this? Yeah, well, I think there are two different components to this. One is a question about the is about the transparency. And I think that while the you know consent decisions are collected and stored on the you know consent management platform or the publisher's side, there effectively is no transparency, right? So that's why one of the features actually that I didn't talk about with regard to ADPC is that both the uh, request surface, the actual request made to the users is always the same. So, you know, it's always presented in a uniform manner. So it's clear and can be understood and understood better over time. And secondly, all of the consents that are granted are also stored as well locally on the user's device so that they can you know, have an overview of it and also directly modify it. So you know, withdraw some consents or add some depending upon you know, at a moment when they actually have the time, the motivation um, to, uh, to delve into that deeper. So I think that you know, there, <clears throat> that's the transparency uh, side that ADPC can identify or can assist with. I mean, with regard to, I mean, um, data processors who simply don't obey the law, uh, well, you know, you can't do anything about that, right, except for prosecute them, right? You need to investigate them. And there is a whole world out there of independent technical researchers, of academic institutes, of uh, NGOs who are doing this kind of work. There are whistleblowers inside of companies. We've seen plenty of that. And, um, and I think, you know, there's enough people around the industry who are really grappling with the idea about what could a better, more acceptable advertising system look like so that these kind of dirty practices I suspect it would eventually get get surfaced, and then you know if there is a legal requirement that they've broken, then they can be sanctioned for that, and that's the way to go about this. It's not simply though to throw one's hands up in the air and say, "All oh, this tech stuff is so complicated, we'll never be able to regulate it." Thanks, Alan. Robin, I'm, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this one as a publisher who who has to manage those types of relationships. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with, with what Alan said. I mean, part of the, the goal of GPC is to provide this very simple, very standardized signal um, that enables uh, simpler auditing of, what, of what's happening. Um, one of the things we like and, and the way in which we've implemented it is that we basically try to remove any, any third party that, that, that would be acting as a controller so that they don't even see the data in the first place. Um, but more generally, I think Alan also pointed to better practices in advertising. Um, uh, you know, it, it's it's not a space in which I have a lot of faith in self-regulation, given given the self-regulation we've seen from from advertising in the past twenty years. It's not very promising. However, it doesn't mean that we can't try on at least some of the aspects. Um, and I think you know, GPC is one component of a broader uh, set of improvements to 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 this ecosystem. And there's a lot of uh, of other technical work ongoing. Uh, notably in, in W3C right now, in order to, to, to help clean up advertising practices. And so I think the idea is to make sure that all of these components align well with one another and are supported by a legal framework. 
Thanks, Robin. Um, the next question, I'm going to read it out, um, is all the speakers so far have referred to tracking and to the direct use of data. However, the cases that most concern many of us, um, especially relating to influencing elections, involve the interpolation of multiple sources of data uh, to enclose inferences about us that we've not consented to even under the cookie banner regime. Um, so even without tracking, these uses would may remain very concerning. Um, what measures would the panel suggest to deal with the threat to our freedom from this kind of data interpolation and triangulation combination of multiple data sources? Uh, Sophie, what are your thoughts on that? Well, this is also a little bit what happened in, in uh, you know, scandals like Cambridge Analytica, I suppose, where they were building, uh, I mean, they were really micro-targeting people and having these, these very uh, detailed uh, profiles made up um, from data from different sources. Um, and that brings me to something else, because we've been talking about the relationship between users and commercial companies. Uh, but these kind of techniques are used by public authorities a lot for uh, you know, law enforcement, security, which, and, and, and also things like uh, 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 fighting social security fraud. And in my country, we've had a massive, massive scandal of essentially ethnic profiling by the tax authorities. Uh, branding people as fraudsters and uh, well I'll spare you the details but the lives of tens of thousands of people have been completely destroyed uh, because of it and I think we are we are very often not sufficiently aware of that but how are you going to how are you going to regulate uh, that 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 kind of use of data because it's indeed it's not tracking it's not necessarily violating uh, the GDPR uh, there are, of course, a couple of um, legislative initiatives or, or policy initiatives uh, on the way, but I think ultimately there has to be a lot more transparency. Uh, companies, but also public authorities, have to be a lot more transparent uh, about what they're doing. We have to, I mean, if they know everything about us and they can build a profile and they can essentially steer our behavior, then we too should have the right to know exactly what they have, how they're using that information, what, uh, uh, you know, the, the algorithmic transparency, but ge more generally transparency uh, about the kind of methods that they're using. Because I think it's not, it's not just harmful to individuals, uh, it's harmful to society and it's harmful to democracy. It's harmful, as I've seen in my country, uh, to the trust in authorities um which is you know which is very 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 damaging and very uh, very alarming so uh partly regulate but we will not be able to regulate everything uh, but i think maximum transparency absolute transparency that's that's the the other uh the other uh leg i think to the uh, the strategy to tackle this Thanks, Sophie. Anna, I can see you nodding uh, vigorously. Tell us, tell us what you think. Well, I would just like to add that indeed, as Sophie says, GDPR as the fundamental right to data protection is essentially a procedural kind of enabling set of rules. Huh? It, it does not necessarily as such prohibit any particular uh, practice, uh, maybe with the exception of, of sensitive data, so-called special categories of data where, such as health data or political or sexual preferences, where the principle is a prohibition, but there are also uh, exceptions. So this is true, but at the same time, uh, I think the, the GDPR does offer a certain baseline of protection, eh? and so arguably uh, in the Dutch uh, situation, um, a lot of uh, human misery could have been avoided if the authorities were aware of their um, basic obligations under the general, under the, the applicable data protection rules, eh? starting from the need to actually have a, a, a legal basis for the processing. And eh? the fact that you can get hold of certain data and combine them in the European legal system does not mean that you are entitled legally to do so. You need a legal basis. Um, and, and a lot of 
you know, provisions, um, uh, rules for profiling, automated decision making, transparency uh, flow from that. So, of course, if, if there is lack of awareness and lack of enforcement and because of the accountability principle approach underpinning the GDPR, even public authorities are no longer obliged to notify eh, or to, to inform uh, anybody about the specific um, processing operations they are conducting, still, as individuals, as data subjects, if we have a suspicion that somebody has your data or you, you know that they are processing it, file a data subject access request, ask for transparency, scrutinize privacy policies, websites, um, you know, go to people, knock on doors, address the, the National um, Data Protection um, Authority with questions, with complaints. Um, ultimately, uh, you know, if we do not also walk the, the, the walk, um, legislation, even the best one, will not take care of, um, of everything. So I would say everybody in this large group of stakeholders has a role uh, to play to already use the, the rules that we have for the better. Right, thanks, Anna. Um, we, we're running almost to time, so I'm going to pass to Robin and then I'll pass back to Sophie to conclude. Uh, yeah, just, I mean, you know, Sophie and, and Anna have both, both talked about transparency. I think, of course, transparency is valuable. Uh, we should not have transparency. Uh, but I think in, in, the, in the context of this question, it's it's insufficient right no no one is going to go to the cambridge analytica website to look up if if you know the data is being used there because you don't even know that that company exists in the in the first place um and 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 you know i i mean i do like the idea that people can do access requests to find out what's about them but we should be cautious of offloading privacy labor onto people instead of enforcing uh, ahead of it and I think you know in the case of this question this is about matching data that comes from multiple different contexts there are very 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 few good reasons to have con data across contexts it, it's there's no there's there's very very few cases in which you need to recognize an identifier here and recognize the same identifier there and be able to match that data in the first place so i think a a a, a stronger option here would be to forbid the recognition of people across different different contexts and and allow some very narrow exemptions to 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 that to that interdiction thanks robin and, and sophie i'll pass to you for a final word yes because i think this is a very important topic actually because i think both very strict uh, uh legislation and transparency are needed uh because if you if you look at the case, I mean, I, I would really recommend that everybody uh, studies this case of what what happened in the Netherlands because it's it's really it's everything is is there. Um, the point is that the, the people who were being profiled, the, 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 the tax authorities deliberately broke the law. Let me start with that. They knew what they were doing. It wasn't that they weren't aware that there was no legal base. They were deliberately breaking the law. Um, they did two things. Essentially, they've been doing racial profiling, ethnic profiling uh, to, to brand people on the basis of ethnicity as potential fraudsters and treating them as if they had already committed fraud. Uh, and the other thing is they, they made an illegal blacklist uh, uh, of over, uh, there was 270,000 names on that list. Um, very often on the basis of anonymous reports, which could be from, I don't know, your ex lover who hates you or whatever. And none of that, I mean, afterwards, when people started to realize years later, when they had lost everything, they had lost their business, their homes, their families, thousands of children have been forcibly taken from their homes. I mean, it's really, it's the biggest scandal after the second world war. And the tax authorities knew what they were doing. They knew it was illegal. So even if there's a very strict law, we also need absolute and total transparency because I have now also experience with uh, uh, requesting, you know, the tax authority signal to me that they had uh, inadvertently shared my information with 
somebody who was not entitled to it, uh, I still have no answers as to whom they have shared it with. Now, I know the law, I know my rights, I can read and write, uh, you know, I have a certain a certain weight, but if you are a vulnerable person, the, the law doesn't serve you. It doesn't help, you know, that you have rights. So there has to be absolute, complete transparency. Everybody should be able to see how these data are being uh, are being used. And I'm, I'm not saying that there will never be any abuse, but if there is abuse by a company and there is constantly abused by companies because they have another incentive, namely uh, big bucks, you know, and, and they're, they're, they're calculating in the fines. They just think like, okay, you know, we're going to get a fine, which will be a maximum of X, uh, but the money we can make by breaking the law is just 10 times more, and therefore we're going to break the law. And we just have this big war chest, and uh, we have a couple of lawyers, and we'll just pay the fines. So um, it's not enough to have to have the law. There also has to be a lot more uh, uh, transparency so that people can actually see what's what's happening. Thank you, Sophie. That was a really brilliant few points to, to end on there. Um, we've run over time now, so unfortunately, we're going to have to close this very interesting discussion. Uh, so I'd just like to finish by thanking, first of all, Open Rights Group, who are our host for this event. Thank you for, for bringing everybody together today. Uh, thank you to all of the speakers. I think this has been a very, very interesting discussion and possibly the start of many more discussions in the future, it feels like. Um, and finally, thank you so much to everybody who's joined us today and asked questions and, and listened to what people are saying. Uh, we will follow up with a recording and um, an email afterwards. But yeah, thank you very much to everybody.